and gentlemen. Good evening, everybody. Warm welcome for uh, joining us, most of you, I would say, uh, again. It is the uh, fifth lecture, one, two, three, four, five, sixth lecture in our series uh, of lectures on the theme of EU energy policy on the road to decarbonization. Uh, this is a series of lectures which is organized uh, not only by the Institute for European Studies, um, from where I am, my name is Harry Kalim, I'm a professor here at the IS, but uh, to, we do this together with uh, Climate Strategies, Ecologic and WWF, and we also very much uh, uh, appreciate the financial support of Jean Monnet, a fund in organizing the series. Uh, the theme, as said, is EU energy policy, and uh, it's decarbonization. And what we have done in the series so far is that we have started with kind of a big picture, general horizontal topics, and then moved uh, from there towards more, let's say, specific issues. And uh, today, as said, we are already on the sixth lecture. And uh, today's uh, topic is a role of energy efficiency improvements in this, uh, on the road to decarbonization. And it's my great pleasure in this context to uh, uh, welcome two speakers. Uh, tonight, uh, first of all, first to my left is Erika Hope. Uh, she's a senior policy officer at, uh, uh, on energy efficiency at Climate Action Network Europe. And, Europe. Uh, and uh, before joining CAN, uh, she was an assistant to Karin Lucas, MEP. Far left from my side, uh, uh, Professor Avil uh, Terbruchen, who is a professor uh, of the Environment and Technology Management Department of the University of Antwerp. Uh, uh, Professor Brücken has uh, been trained uh, in Louvain, Antwerp, and also on the other side of the ocean in Stanford University. And he's uh, presently working in various uh, topics uh, and units, which he himself has been co-founder of uh, uh, at the uh, at the university, such as STEM, Synergy, and Finis, um, if I'm pronouncing them correctly, more or less. Um, he has also held uh, numerous positions uh, in the. Uh, in the Belgian uh, government uh, advisory position. So, for example, he was a president of the Environmental Advisory Council from 91 uh, to 95, and the principal advisor to the Minister of the Environment from 1990 to 2001. So, uh, we are very uh, glad to have you here uh, with us as well. Uh, 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 and uh, I can mention here that we had also a third speaker uh, foreseen for this uh, evening, uh, who was uh, Birgit Bey, or Bay, uh, a, the Danish uh, energy attaché from the permanent representation, uh, representation of Denmark. But uh, regrettably, uh, her duties in that very position called her to an extraordinary council meeting just tonight, all day event, from which uh, she regrettably said could not uh, join us. So she uh, sends her apologies to, to us in that respect. Anyway, so this, we have an interesting um, agenda for us for tonight, and the plan of the night is such that um, mm -hmm. uh, 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 Professor uh, Verbruggen will start <coughs> the lecture. Uh, you have about 25 to 30 minutes, uh, considering we only have now two speakers, so you should have uh, plenty of time to uh, uh, present economics perspectives to the issue. And then uh, from a stakeholder, from an NGO perspective, uh, uh, Erika will then uh, give us another uh, 25 to 30 minutes of presentation, after which, as is the tradition, we will open the floor for a nice, lively debate, as has been the tradition here. So, um, I think without further ado, <coughs> I'm Professor Bru Verbruggen. So, thank you. Uh, thank you also for the extra time I get of 10 <laughs> minutes, because uh, even then I had to cut a lot in the slides for this presentation. We are talking about energy efficiency and energy efficiency is so immediately related to energy use. And when you talk about energy use, you're speaking about what's happening continuously from the 1st of January until the end of December in men's life, in all men's life, in all organizations' life. So energy is everywhere and we as catholics we have to study where is god and then we had to say god is in heaven on earth and everywhere well this is the same with energy <laughs> so if we have to 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 analyze this and 
energy use is everywhere and so energy efficiency should also be everywhere so it's an immense subject it's an immense subject that is not it's not feasible to tweet it in just 30 minutes you should give me two hours and even then it would be too little anyhow the introductory slide shows that in our opinion renewable energy and energy efficiency are very much related to one another that's one and this together have to make our common future and everyone remembers the title of our common future that means a sustainable society a sustainable developed society are really based on both and if they don't touch each other if they can't hook in each other then we have no bright future this is our analysis so what we are going to cover in this short introduction is first some words about decarbonization where you are familiar with I believe then some words about energy efficiency potentials uh, what, what is feasible in the area of efficiency and we will already have there the, the impression that price is a very important driver of efficiency so my analysis here is mainly an economics analysis it's an analysis of an economist that looks at the world and sees what needs to be done and what can happen with energy use and energy efficiency we come then to the concept of backstop energy and use intensity uh, this will be clear of the first slides I hope uh, the need for rebuilding the energy bills of people by using levies uh, levies uh, the word is taxes but that's a little bit the wrong word levies is the proper word for raising prices by the government for paying for externalities that's not the same as taxes lock in or real transform this is the next point and then we come to the issue of corporate versus public pricing and conclusions okay let's start to be serious about decarbonization about the let's say uh, target the goal of a maximum of two degree celsius ceiling in temperature rise <coughs> and it's an old idea maybe but it's 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 an existing uh, proposal to converge and to contract the emissions of all countries in the world uh, what you see on this slide is that when we are serious about the two degrees celsius all the countries in the world have by 2050 to have a low emissions quantity per capita there are kilos per person kilos 2000 4000 but we all should be at that moment in the range of maybe negative even or zero up to let's say 3000 3500 if you are not striving for this you never will meet that goal of plus two degrees Celsius. You will come to three and a half, four maybe, and this is extremely scary. It's a, a, a huge challenge. So when you want to come there, you have to agree on some ceiling, some upper limit of emissions per capita on average per country. And beneath this ceiling you will have a variety of patterns depending on the type of country you may have pioneer countries like maybe Denmark when the person would have been here or Norway who have more possibilities than us to reduce our carbon emissions per capita going down faster and further than other countries some developing countries maybe first go up but then should know they have also to come down this is something, a program of decarbonization we have to agree with. Okay, if you want to realize this, you have to 
look at where are the emissions per capita coming from, emissions per person coming from, and let's focus on the main source of greenhouse <coughs> gas emissions, the ones of CO2. CO2, energy related CO2, it means more than two thirds of all greenhouse gases emitted yearly. And this is generally decomposed in three terms. The three terms is the wealth per person, mostly expressed as GDP per person. Then you have the energy intensity of GDP, kilowatt or energy per unit GDP, per <coughs> dollar of wealth, so to say. Then you have CO2 emissions <coughs> per kilowatt hour of energy. Now, what we really have to bring down is this factor. United States at 24,000 kilograms, 24 ton per person. Uh, we have to come down significantly. And how you can come down? Mainly by the two technical factors, this one and this one. No one is really willing to depress or to minimize the wealth per person. The rich countries are not willing to give in and the poor countries want to be rich like the rich are today. This is the world and this is impossible to change. And this is normal. So the only factors where we really can have success are the two last ones, this one and this one. So this is energy intensity and it's interesting then to decompose a little bit what energy intensity really means and energy intensity in this uh, analysis has a pivotal role. It means that this is the bridge between this and this factor. It's in, in between and you can decompose it further as a sum of activities. <coughs> activities A and we have numerous activities like driving cars or trying to use the train or eating breakfast or whatever. We have hundred thousands of activities and those activities use energy. Every activity uses energy and that is the, how much energy is used per unit of activity. This means energy efficiency. The less energy you use per activity, the better your efficiency is. You see that the prices are taken with it. Why are the prices taken with it? Because <coughs> these are the observed <coughs> variables. I'm going to look at it. These are the observed variables in the statistics. This is budget shares that we spent on particular activity A, and this is the energy intensity of that particular activity A. You understand? So energy efficiency as such is very difficult to measure even to define. I don't know, everyone talks about energy efficiency, but energy efficiency, strictly speaking, is difficult to measure and define. But what's much easier available in statistics are energy intensities. How much money eh, do you spend on particular activities and how much energy you use in those activities? And this is energy intensity. Now, you see that you have the two factors together in the total energy intensity. Now this is mainly a technical issue. How can you decrease the quantity of energy for realizing the wealth of particular activities? And this is mainly social to choice. What type of activities do you perform for realizing your GDP? In other ways, how is your GDP composed? What's the structure of your economy? And if you want a more fancy word, it means lifestyles. What type of lifestyles do you adopt? Or do you accept in a society? Now, analysis of the past, up to a few years ago, 
found out that decreases in energy intensity had to do almost four-fifths with the factor of efficiency, so the more technical aspects, and about one-fifth with, let's say, choices in society and composition of the GDP lifestyles. Now this is something that is certainly going to change if we want to have the energy intensities down, down, down much more than today. The proportion of the efficiency factor will decrease and the importance of the structure factor will increase. And we, we will have to change our uh, GDP anyway. Okay, in studies that we did for IPCC and reporting in IPCC, we studied a lot about <coughs> what are the potentials, the efficiency potentials, or in the case of IPCC, we talked about emission reduction potentials, mitigation potentials, but the basis of this was often the energy efficiency potentials. Now, energy efficiency potentials are dependent on technologies that you apply, the technical factor, and the practices that you adopt, the more uh, structural activities factor. What you see is that these potentials are a, uh, a, a, let's say, the leveling of, of uh, core potentials that are easily to assess and are there. Then you have a wider range that's more uh, diffuse, so to say, and still a wider range, and still a wider range, and so on. Now, potentials are realized by policies and policy instruments. And policy and policy instruments here are quickly spread into enabling support, financial incentives, and regulation. Mm -hmm. Now, what you see is that all those factors have an impact on the potentials, but that true financial incentives levies and subsidies, the energy prices are affected and energy prices play a huge role in uh, deploying and in, in realizing efficiency potentials. Also technological innovation is the second main factor that is realized by an R&D push but also by an R&D pool and in the R&D pool energy prices again play a major factor to realize those potentials. This is a general scheme and that presents you a little bit the relationship between both uh, or various variables. Now we did a small statistical analysis of the relationship, what is really affecting the differences in energy intensity among various economies. And for this it's quite pretty difficult to find good statistics. So after searching and searching, we finally came to statistics on electricity intensity, because that statistics were available. And we also had at that time information about the average end use electricity price for various countries. Mm -hmm. Now what you see here, the dots are the statistical observations for various countries, and the line is a regression line eh, with statistical package that we find between the price of electricity and the electricity intensity of a country. Now, what we found is that that relationship, eh, for the ones who still remember some mathematics, is an hyperbole. It's an orthogonal hyperbole. That means that the intensity times the price is a constant. Yes? <coughs> what does it mean? Is that you can get the slides from me and the identity. Uh, what it means is that the price times the intensity is the area of this rectangle is equal for Japan as, for example, for Korea. This is the price, this is the intensity, this is the area of this rectangle. And what does this area mean? This is the percentage of the GDP a country is spending 
on getting electricity to the economy, production, again, export and distribution. So all the costs for getting electricity out from the wall is a percentage of GDP and this is the same for Japan as for Korea. So what you see is that there is quite a <coughs> strong connection between the price of electricity and the electricity intensity. High prices means a low intensity, low prices means a high intensity. This is the general rule that we observe. With that information, we had some piece of statistical curve. We did a small exercise. The small <coughs> exercise is the following, that we want to find out when energy efficiency will be sufficient. Because you can reduce your consumption of energy more and more and more, but at some point there should be an end because without energy you can't live and so you need some energy and help and the question is how much energy how performant can you get in lowering the energy intensity of your GDP and especially why should you go lower than this best level that Japan and Denmark had to realize 200 kilowatt hour or 200 watt hour per dollar wealth creation you should go lower further to pay for the alternative in energy supply that we need for decarbonization. And what must we realize for decarbonization? That's a full renewable energy economy. Renewable energy all over the world for every nation developed, developing all must be able to afford renewable energy. Now, people sometimes argue that renewable energy will come cheap. I don't believe this. Renewable energy, when it has to take over all the fossil fuel energy and nuclear power, will be expensive. Today, renewable energy is also subsidized by, let's say, false prices of fossil fuels. We don't pay the full cost of fossil fuels in the past. If you really want to have a, a, a renewable energy economy, you will must be willing to afford the full cost price of renewable energy, and this is high. But at that high price, you can get all energy that you can imagine. It's unlimited supply but at a high price. The question is, can we this afford? Well, everything depends if this extrapolation would be valid. When this extrapolation would be valid and we go to this price, then we can afford it. Why we can afford it is that we should reach the backstop intensity. It means an intensity not of 200, but when we did some finger calculations, we came at about 75 kilowatt or watt hour per dollar wealth. So why can we afford this? Because this bill is the same bill as Japan has today and as Korea has today. The same cost for the GDP for supplying all the electricity to the economy with renewable energy, but an economy with a much lower energy intensity or in this case electricity intensity. Can you follow this or is this a little bit too abstract? Interesting our limits I think. Uh, uh, it's we can, limits. we okay. can come back to the, uh, that, that, that the questions. Okay. okay, so this is the affordable bill because mm -hmm. the bill remains almost constant. Uh, of course to realize this, uh, to, to come to that point you have to curve this you have to climb this curve and, and this requires a policy preparation of quite some time. Now how do you climb such a curve? There are at this moment two proposals. I didn't include in the slides uh, the other proposal. That's emissions trading. 
mission training is building an external step here, <coughs> and that external step falls down now and then because this curve is moving, yeah. and then it falls down and price is almost zero, and then they try to to draw it up again. That's EU uh, policy. The real solid solution is to have a inner stair, a solid stair of bills, uh, pricing steps that brings people from a high energy intensity stepwise to a low energy intensity and this price should be composed mainly of levies, uh, not of prices set by the oil companies or the electricity companies but by levies. So what is a real effort we have to do is to to rebuild our energy bills. We have from this type of energy bill and the same bill should be one like this with much less quantity, much more efficiency with higher cost of supply presumably because you lose economies of scale, a profit margin that is higher but total profits that are lower and then you have a margin of levies, levies that you can use to pay for the efficiency costs because efficiency is not free, efficiency has a price. Okay, let's fast go to a simple question time in three rounds. Is renewable energy necessary for decarbonization? Yes. Is it desirable? Majority will say yes. Uh, is it feasible technically? Yes. Uh, is it economical? Yes, but only economic when we realize that backstop intensity and when we don't let increase the bills of people too high. Uh, political uh, generally they are in favor of it. Second question is then that backstop efficiency is it necessary? Yes, eh, to make renewable energy feasible. Is it desirable? The majority will say maybe yes, but do no. Eh? People is <coughs> lazy, people prefer to be inefficient, eh? to take uh, the car, the plane, eh? not to walk, not to bike, eh? uh, not to care about energy use. So the majority as would uh, vote no here. Uh, is it technically feasible? Yes. Uh, is there a limit? We can overcome those limits. Uh, but from an economic point of view, you will need levies to realize this. Then is the question, energy levies, is this necessary? Yes. Is it desirable? The whole community says no. Right? No more taxes. It's very easy to make a coalition of very different trade unions, uh, employers, Testa uh, Sharp, uh, Testa Group, uh, and so on. They all come together to say no against energy levies. Uh, is it feasible? Yes. Uh, is it economical? Yes. But political, it's extremely difficult to realize. And this is the pinpoint of the policy. Why is it so difficult? It has some historical bounds, and I see an old colleague from the past when we were together in some meetings, I think, on energy efficiency. This is the actual energy use of Belgium in the period 1960-2000. Everyone has heard about the young people who are not born, eh, but some of the older people have been uh, in the midst of this the first energy crisis and the second energy crisis and like any crisis I had a heart attack a few one year ago so what you do then is you do some exercise and sports <laughs> and you come down and wait you become healthy and then after a while you forget and start to eat again and you have a second attack and then you really say it's serious <laughs> no, no I'm doing real <laughs> efforts and real real uh, exercise and your, your weight goes down and this happened in 73 and 79 with our energy economy. And some people said that, well, let's continue like this. Amory Lovins was world famous for presenting that scenario. Let's follow this efficiency path. You see, we can do it. Uh, it's, it's feasible technically and so on. We can do it. That's but on the other hand, everyone knows that 
when prices of energy are high, suppliers see huge possibilities of making profits and there have been growth scenarios for energy demand. These are the official scenarios of the uh, White Book from 79 in Belgium, published by the Minister Willy Klaas at the time, with three scenarios. The middle scenario was the most likely one. So all the suppliers have been building infrastructure on this basis. And high, many, many power units and infrastructure capacities. And of course, what <laughs> happens then is that you create a high overcapacity. Overcapacity in supply, a power station you only can use to produce power. If there is no demand for power, you lose your money. So what was then on the agenda? We should be able to push demand up. How do you push demand up? By falling prices. So the energy prices fall down at that time and were not increased by levies. Levies were on the blacklist forever since then. So no one is willing to speak about levies because levies is, is really lobbied out of the world and lobbied out may, mainly by energy interests who know that when prices are high by levies, people start to be very efficient. You have overcapacity your sales go down and your profits disappear. So this is a little bit the, the scenario uh, that happens with blocking phenomena. So one should really avoid blocking. So I'm almost done. Let's try to be rationally radical. Uh, radical, we don't have to invent. Other people have invented this for us. Ms. Brundtland and the staff of UN people have written a book about sustainable development. If you read chapter 2 of that book, this is one of the most radical programs you can imagine in the world. It's very radical, so you need an urgent and drastic change, and this is contrary to business as usual. What is now rational? Rational is that from an economics point of view that I'm also personally very convinced that it makes very little sense to hope for a new type of human kind. People is what it is. People is mainly <coughs> economically driven. The self-interest is the most important force that drives people. And some people will say, well, I'm not happy about this. I'm very happy about that. It's almost like the gravity force that keeps people in place. Of course, many times we have to overcome the gravity force, but we must try to come together to overcome that gravity force. But it's good that that main constant force is there to organize society. So we don't need a new type of people. All experiments in the previous century that has been set up in societies with new types of people, extreme left or extreme right, has gone wrong. And mostly in societies. The only thing you have to do is to rebuild energy systems. And civilization will fall. We have to reform the GDP. We don't have to get away with the GDP. GDP is a nice indicator. The only thing very wrong about GDP is that Many activities have a wrong price because we don't pay the externalities. If we pay the right price for all the goods and services, GDP is fine. We have to dumb the old solutions guide and language. And this is very difficult. People always say we have to change 100 degrees, 180 degrees, but they always continue the same road. So this is extremely difficult. What in my opinion, we also should do is not follow a place in the pantheon. I, I'm not convinced that we need all options. Like IEA often says, we need 80% from efficiency and renewables and 10% from nuclear and 10% from CCS. I don't believe it. I think nuclear has no future and CCS has also almost no future. 
80% can be 100% as a solution. And this is no portfolio thinking and historically I say the, right, the real Christians that changed the Roman Empire never accepted the place in the energy or religious pantheon of Rome. So sometimes you have to, to be radical in certain ways. Now interest, instruments, mechanisms, that's really important and that deals with money, power and influence. And that's why even I'm strictly economic in the logic I'm giving you, I believe that by following that money logic we really come to the essence of the core of the problem. Who governs the money in the world? Who governs the money in the world? Who governs the money? governs the power, governs the influence. And this is, in the case of energy systems today, mainly the major energy societies. So what we see today is that we have a discussion, and we should focus our discussion on who is pricing CO2. Are we accepting corporate pricing, or do we need public pricing? And I repeat a little bit the challenges that are before us. We have to shift from dirty fossil fuels to atmospheric and carbon uh, overloads. Now this system we have to change. For changing this, we must take actions. Shrink the use, that means become more efficient, uh, and raise efficiency and renewable energy. And for this, we need higher end use prices fossil fuels. Now the real question is who will raise the prices and cash the money? And then we have two solutions, higher corporate prices and higher public prices. And what we have today is this solution. We charge oil today at $100 per barrel. Most of the oil that's pumped up is costing $5 per barrel. So who is earning $95 per barrel of oil? And what are they doing with that money? That is increasing more dirty fuels, more problems. And what we really need is higher public prices where the money that we get out of the higher prices flows back to the own economy to increase energy efficiency and renewable energy. This is, in my opinion, the real crucial issue that people who want to save the planet for climate change should focus on. This is who sets the prices, who cashes the money, and what policy do we uh, realize. Okay, I'm going to the conclusion. Renewable energy and energy efficiency are technically sufficient for a full transition. So we don't need new, new mankind, and we just need to do that job together to change over our energy systems fully, uh, but they, it's, it's not a question that it will come from itself. It is dependent on policies and policy instruments. We can unlock the potentials by dollar flows, boosted and directed by levies, uh, that make prices relevant for pressures. I don't believe in the uniform carbon tax, I, I haven't said this, I don't believe in global permit trading, this is uniform thinking in a very diverse world. I argue mainly for fine-tuned pressures based on diversity, carrying capacities of persons and organizations. So, so it's, it's a huge patchwork we have to do, and all of this patchwork is going on today. Every country has some patchwork already in place. You are not going to save this by a uniform instrument. If you do this well, you are really going to induce innovation in the direction of efficiency and renewable energy, and activities in society or lifestyles, if you want another world, will really change, but not by orders or people, bureaucrats that say you can do this or that, but by the invisible hands of this, those pressures that are organized in society. This is the roundup of that short introduction. Thank you.
Thank you very much. That's uh, Professor uh, Dr. Bruchel. You are really giving us a nice, uh, nice outline, uh, moving from economics to religion to uh, medicine. <laughs> even uh, we heard that uh, the patient has had to cardiac arrests, but it's still alive, I presume. So let's see for how long and what we should do about that. Uh, 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 let's see what Erica Hope has to tell us from the issue. Okay, so I um, have a quite different presentation. Uh, it's much more political and policy based than uh, Ariel's, um, but I think he's made the case very well for ultimately what we're driving at, which is to maximise the potential of, of energy efficiency. Um, so I am going to yeah, find out how towards this works. Um, so I'm going to first just take a look um, in a rather more simplistic way just at why energy savings are so important. Uh, then I will talk a bit about what the EU has done so far to try and tap that potential of energy efficiency and savings um, and we find that really we haven't done enough. Um, then we will look at what the EU has planned. Um, it's just agreed a big new directive on energy efficiency so I'll speak briefly about that and then have a little look at what we might hope for in the years to come. So first, just to explain who CAN is, I work for Climate Action Network, which is actually an umbrella group of environmental NGOs. Uh, we're part of a global network, I think it's the biggest global network of civil society organisations working on climate and energy. And it first came together in the context of the UN negotiations for a global climate agreement. But now we have regional nodes in many different parts of the world, as you see. And CAN Europe is the biggest uh, regional node. And we have about 145 members, which, as you see here, include some very big ones like Oxfam and Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth and WWF, um, but also some much smaller uh, organisations. So I don't know if you can see any from your own country, but uh, we have them in most countries of the EU and more. So. Why are energy savings so important? Well, obviously as a climate organisation, first, our first consideration is, is, is climate and greenhouse gases. Um, and the whole theme obviously of this, this lecture series is the fact that the EU needs to um, well, make 80 to 95% emission reductions by uh, the year 2050 if the EU is to make its fair share towards uh, avoiding dangerous climate change. Now, 80 to 95% reductions is a lot. It's really almost unthinkable the changes that this may mean for our economy. And so of course it makes sense to do the cheapest and most cost efficient uh, measures first. And in fact, energy efficiency and savings are by far the, the cheapest and most cost effective solutions. Uh, and actually there are enough, there is enough potential in that domain um, to actually deliver about half of the reductions that we need to make by the year 2050. So that's the kind of framing point. But we actually need to act very quickly if we're going to start making the most of them. Now, this is a graph that I've taken from the World Energy Outlook. Uh, you probably know the International Energy Agency do this um, trending uh, analysis each year where they look at what the global trends in energy consumption and production are. And they look at a number of different scenarios because they've also, they, they look to see how, how we're doing on the, the greenhouse gas emission front. And one of their scenarios, their sort of supposedly greenest scenario is what they call the 450 scenario, which is a trajectory of greenhouse gas uh, emissions that would see uh, a, a concentration of greenhouse gas emissions stabilizing at about 450 parts per million which is what we need to have a 50% chance of avoiding two degrees global temperature increase. So it's only to get a 50% chance of avoiding dangerous climate change. But even if we're going for this trajectory, then in fact, by 2017, if we don't act further with the current trajectory that we're on, by 2017, we'll actually be having all of the power stations and the factories and the buildings and so on, all of the emissions that we're allowed to have by 2050 in order to, uh, we'll be locked into having more emissions than we're allowed to have if we're to avoid this, this, uh, this increase. 
they have just actually released the International Energy Agency their new World Energy Outlook, which is, uh, yes, it was released yesterday, I think. Um, and this actually has a big focus on energy efficiency this year. And the big headline finding uh, is that, in fact, if we would do a lot of energy efficiency, globally speaking, we would actually buy ourselves five years before this lock-in point, which is still not that much, especially considering how much effort is going to be needed to do that amount of energy efficiency. But it's, it's, it's a start. That's the global perspective. Also in Europe, um, you may be aware that there have been a number of different roadmaps done over the last few years that show how Europe might reach its, uh, its decarbonisation goals by 2050. Energy efficiency is absolutely central to all of these. We will not be able to do the amount of decarbonisation that we need to do by 2050 if we don't tap this energy efficiency potential. And we need to start soon. Um, so our interest <laughs> is primarily in the, uh, the greenhouse gas aspect of it. However, uh, we are very keen on the fact that actually energy efficiency, thank you, is uh, also having a great many other benefits. Um, you can see Mr. Putin here. He um, currently takes about, well, almost, well, a very large proportion of the 400 billion euros a year that the EU sends out uh, to third countries for imports of oil and natural gas. Um, and this this trend of depending, depending greatly on, on third countries for our energy imports is, is increasing a lot. And if we would tap the energy efficiency potential, then of course we would uh, become less dependent on the external sources. Uh, in fact, uh, we, would, we, have, we could potentially reverse our import dependency back down to 1990 levels, uh, rather than this constant, constant increasing trend. Um, there are also large financial savings to come from energy savings. I mean, obviously, it depends on energy prices, but a conservative estimate uh, by the Dutch research group ECOFIS is that actually, if the EU would uh, tap its full cost-effective energy saving potential, then by the year 2020, the EU could be making net financial savings, so savings after they've invested all the money needed in the energy efficiency measures, of 200 billion euros a year. Um, and then there are many other factors as well, like uh, obviously one of the major things that we can do to reduce our energy use is to address the efficiency of our building stock. So to make buildings essentially more comfortable uh, and better heated, which can have very positive effects for people's quality of life uh, and uh, fuel poverty rates and so on. So it's a bit of a no-brainer really, energy efficiency. Uh, we ought to be doing our very best on it. So how is the EU actually doing? Well, as a person who works on EU climate and energy policy, these three twenties are kind of um, our starting point for many things. As you're probably aware, um, the EU has three targets for the year 2020 related to climate and energy. Uh, it has a target to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by 20% has another target to have 20% of final energy use coming from renewables by the year 2020, and it has another one, the energy efficiency target, which is to reduce its energy use by 20% by the year 2020. Um, now, actually, I should have put one of these not in bold because the two target, the first targets I mentioned, the emissions target and the renewables target, are legally binding, whereas the energy efficiency target is not legally binding. Um, and while we are actually pretty well on track to meet the emissions target and the renewable target, unfortunately the same is definitely not the same for the energy efficiency target. Um, I sort of deliberately confuse there slightly whether it's called an efficiency target or a savings target. In common parlance, people call it the energy efficiency target, but actually it is a target to reduce energy consumption in absolute terms. Um, in fact, it is to... The, the top blue blob shows where, what our energy consumption would be according, according to business as usual in the year 2020. And the bottom blue blob is the 20% target. So what our energy consumption should be in the year 2020 if we reduced it compared to that business as usual level by 20%. Unfortunately, the middle blob is actually where it looks like we're going to end up, or at least until we have this new directive. This knight in shining armour of a new directive. So basically, we're, 
our current rates of progress, even with the policies that the EU has so far got on energy efficiency, we're due to miss the 20% target in 2020 by half, at least half, uh, which is a bit of a shame when you think of all of those imperatives to make these reductions. So why is this? Well, nobody's saying that tapping the energy efficiency potential is easy. For a start, the potential is distributed right across the economy. Now this graph is taken from a European Commission impact assessment, um, and it shows the available cost-effective energy saving potential in uh, each of the main energy using sectors of the economy. Now the red part of each bar is the untapped potential, the potential that exists which is currently not being accessed by people's behaviour and the policies that we have in place. And as you see, there is a very large amount of untapped potential in the energy sector, uh, in transport, and particularly in residential buildings as well. And one of the other problems, or one of the reasons why there is all of this untapped potential, is because there has been a tendency by governments to think that energy savings will just happen by itself. Energy efficiency is so cost-effective and so sensible that any rational economic actor will just, of course, find ways to reduce their energy use so that they don't have to spend so much money on energy. But actually, it's more complicated than that. Even if energy prices were much higher than they are today, um, there are many other things that act on people's decisions. If I think about myself, if I wanted to renovate my house, then the first thing I need to think about was whether I could be bothered to clean out my loft and do go to all the hassle of having the builders in and having to, to move out for a while while, it, while the work was done and so on. If I, even if I thought I could do that, then it costs a lot of money and maybe I don't have the spare money and maybe I, if I did, I'd rather go on holiday. I mean, even if I did think I was really green and good and I wanted to do it, well then, where would I go for them? Where would I get the information? Are there any reliable suppliers to do this? It's a, it's a big thing to do and it's not something that just because I think I'd like to save a few euros on my energy bill each month I'm going to do. And it actually gets even more complicated, of course, if I didn't actually live in a house that I owned. I don't own a house, but if I did, um, if, if I'm the landlord, then chances are I'm not going to be interested in investing in making a property that I own more efficient because I, won't, I don't pay the energy bills. The tenant pays the energy bills, so I don't actually get to benefit from the energy bill savings that result from the investments that I would have made. So that's the split incentive problem that you might have heard about. Same with transport. As uh, Ariel said, it's just very easy to do the wrong thing, <laughs> or not easy enough to do the right thing. I might want to be green and take the bus rather than the car, but what if there isn't a bus route going where I want to go? Often transport systems aren't as good as they should be. Or I might think I wanted to buy an electric car, but then where would I charge it up? The systems aren't good enough. Or I might be an energy manager in a factory, and I might think, oh, I'm, I'll invest in some nice new energy efficient processes, but actually, the payback time of these processes is going to be about five years perhaps, and I'm really more interested in a much quicker return than that. So it's not straightforward. The payoffs are not as obvious as they should be, which is why government intervention is needed to compel people to invest in energy efficiency, or to incentivise them to do it, or to help them to do it. Different things are needed depending on which sector and which kind of people you're talking about. So the EU has tried. Um, before this new directive that I mentioned, uh, it had, well, what I kind of refer to as a Christmas tree of different legislation for, for energy efficiency. There's this non-binding target uh, to reduce energy consumption by 2020, but there's a specific directive for buildings, uh, the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive. Now this is quite good for new buildings, um, by the year 2019 for public buildings and 2020 for all other buildings, um, all buildings that are new, newly built will have to be nearly zero energy. Uh, you can hear the language of compromise right there. Um, but it basically means that it needs to be very uh, efficient buildings um, with what energy they do use coming from uh, renewable sources. So that's all excellent. And as of you know, these years, all of the new buildings that are being built will be really good and efficient. However, new buildings is only a very small proportion of the building stock. Um, it's actually, well, um, estimates are about between 1 and 5% of the buildings that were going to be in place by 2050. 
So it doesn't really do a lot on new buildings, uh, on existing buildings. Then we have the Eco Design and Energy Labelling Directives. These are directed at energy using products, so things like fridges or washing machines or industrial motors or light bulbs. Um, and they're two directives that are supposed to work together. So the idea with the Eco Design Directive is that it sets minimum energy performance standards for different products. So eventually, the least efficient models in a particular product category will be progressively phased out. So you know you can't buy the same light bulbs that you used to buy now, and over time you won't be able to buy the halogen light bulbs anymore. And eventually, the idea is that the least efficient ones get phased out. And at the same time, the energy labelling directive is supposed to help push or encourage the market to make things even better and more efficient, because it will direct consumers to the most efficient products. So this one is actually not so bad, it's working quite well, but it's obviously quite a long and complicated process to revise the standards for each product category. Um, so it's, it's not an overnight solution. Then there was a thing called the Energy Services Directive, which has now been replaced by this new Energy Efficiency Directive. And this was a rather strange thing. <laughs> it was sort of kind of a collection of all of the good ideas anybody had ever had about how to encourage a market in energy efficiency and so on. But it was very non-compelling. When you read it, it sort of would name these things as a good idea, like setting up an energy efficiency fund or encouraging energy companies to provide energy efficiency to their to their customers. But it was all rather optional. Governments didn't have to do a great deal with it. And although there were some things they did have to do, it hasn't been very well implemented and it hasn't delivered a lot. Um, then there's been also some particular regulations on CO2 in cars and vans, which obviously in practice turns out to be an efficiency standard. Um, and also a, a directive on combined heat and power. But, as we've seen, even with all of this legislation, we, have, we aren't really on track to meet this target. So, having realised this, um, the Member States called on the European Commission to do something about it, and to improve uh, the legislative push towards energy efficiency. And back in June of last year, they came up with a proposal for a new energy efficiency directive. Quite an exciting name there. Um, and in fact, those of us working on it fondly called it the mother of all directives because it was a big monster of a thing that covered all different parts of the economy. It covered both the supply side and the end use side. And I think in the council discussions, they talked about it as being seven directives in one or something. It's really a big, a big thing. But anyway, it's been quite a big feature of my life over the last year and I think those of a couple of other people I see in the room um, and um, this negotiations took place uh, between the European Parliament and the Council um, during the first half of this year um, and actually today's a big day because it's entered the uh, Ordre du Jour of the, so it actually enters force today I think um, which, uh, which is great cause for celebration <laughs> so what is actually in this thing? Um, had Birgitta Bay here been here, we might have had more of a discussion about the, uh, the politics of how this thing came about, but unfortunately she's not. So um, I'll just tell you what's in there. Um, well, first thing to say is that there is no binding target. While we tried our very best as NGOs and other advocates of energy efficiency to argue for a, for a binding energy saving target, because, in fact, even the Commission's impact assessment showed that that was the only sure way to make sure that we would meet the 2020 target. The Member States really didn't want this. Um, they said, we don't want binding targets, we'll just have binding measures. And then, of course, when binding measures were proposed, they didn't really like those either. But, um, so initially, we were kind of disappointed. Um, but actually, with a little bit of distance, it's not bad. The directive does say that in the year 2020, the EU's energy consumption must be no more than 1,474 million tonnes of oil equivalent of primary energy or an equivalent in final energy. Now, when you think about it, this is actually quite a big deal for 27 countries to agree collectively that that's what their energy consumption will be, that they will limit it to not being more than that, and that they will find ways to bring it to that level. And this is the first time that this has ever been written into a European directive. So that is quite good. And in order to try and meet this, the Member States are supposed to come up with their own idea of what they'd like to have as a target, they've got to submit those next year. Um, and then in 2014, the European Commission will make an assessment as to whether 
we're on track to meet the 2020 target and whether what the member states have submitted is going to be enough. Now this is all a bit silly really because we already know most of what the member states will submit and we know that they don't add up to 20 but nevertheless this was the compromise that was found. Um, and then the other thing, the other sort of target that's in there is that each member state will have to each year deliver energy savings that are equivalent to one and a half percent of effectively the previous year's energy consumption. Um, and this actually didn't start off as a target in quite that way. It was supposed to be originally just a requirement on member states to put in place energy company obligation schemes. Now, this is an idea that's based on what already exists in quite a few member states. So the UK, uh, Denmark, France, Italy, and Flanders uh, already had schemes in place which require energy, well, in some cases energy distributors, and in some cases energy suppliers, to actually effectively provide their customers with energy efficiency measures as well as selling them energy. Um, and this is quite a cool idea in a philosophical way um, because the idea is that if you have this kind of scheme it will start to change the business model of energy companies from being something where their aim is to just sell as much energy as possible to actually deliver to consumers energy services. So to try and clarify that, if I'm at home and I turn on my radiator I don't think, if I think about it at all, I'm not thinking I want lots of gas to be coming into my flat at this point so that I can have a warm room. I'm thinking I want a warm room. And if in fact I could have that warm room by means of using less gas but having a better insulated apartment, then that's good for me and it's good for the environment and, and, and that's what you can actually be hoping that your energy company will deliver you. So. The idea is that these obligation schemes were supposed to deliver these 1.5% one, one annual savings, but in fact, uh, in the end, if they can find other ways to deliver these 1.5% savings. But there is a sort of strong encouragement in the directive to put in place these schemes. Um, then there's a lot of other things in the directive which I won't go through in great detail. I'm sure the slides can be circulated afterwards. Um, but uh, just to name a couple of them, um, there's a renovation rate so that public buildings should be renovated at 3% a year. Um, again, unfortunately, this was quite weakened during the negotiations. Originally, it was supposed to be all public buildings, so covering hospitals and schools and things like that. Um, and in the end, it kind of got whittled down to <laughs> central government buildings only, which we're reliably informed in Germany is 12 buildings, so it's not going to change the world by itself, this one. But um, anyway, they're more exciting to the, to the building industry um, is that member states will have to prepare renovation roadmaps for the renovation of their entire building stock by the year 2050. Um, now, uh, there's a bit of an obsession in Europe at the moment with roadmaps, but um, nevertheless, the idea is that this, this, these should be comprehensive strategies that uh, look at all aspects of the financing, the supply chain, the training, um, the sort of geographical organisation of, of how this would happen. So it's really a way to focus minds about how to get this thing finally happening. Um, I think, yes, yeah, so I won't say too much more than that because I'm going on quite long. I think. Um, so even with all of these things, in the end, unfortunately, the Energy Efficiency Directive will not succeed in delivering the 20% target. Um, the NGOs have been working with um, an alliance of industry associations and um, civil, uh, well, social housing organisations and so on collectively to, to, to lobby for a stronger energy efficiency directive. And we came up with this thing called the gapometer, um, which the, the outside thing shows the full gap that there was to the 20% energy saving target. And the underneath part shows the different elements of the energy efficiency directive and how much they contribute to closing that gap. And as you see, in the end, we're still going to miss the 20% target by a quarter. Um, it might be closed a little bit more by some extra things that are in the pipeline for um, some of those eco-design standards from that other directive I mentioned, so for boilers and water heaters and things. Um, and also there are some new, um, more stringent standards expected for car efficiency. So with that, we think it might get up to about 17% savings by 2020. And then, of course, there's this review in 2014. Um, so it might be that we managed to get some more stringent measures in place. But just as an interesting political reflection, 
I will just show you, because the gapometer makes this kind of comparison possible, um, that the final agreement was actually weaker even than the European Commission's proposal. Um, and, um, you know, normally, I'm sure you know very well the, the European um, legislation making process, you start with a um, proposal from the European Commission and then it gets negotiated between the European Council and the European Parliament. Now, the sort of sensible thing <laughs> would be for the Commission to go for the most ambitious thing possible, knowing that the Council generally tries to weaken it. In our view, the Commission went for something a bit too weak in the beginning. But um, as you see, the Parliament's position, as you see, uh, actually would have closed the gap. It was very ambitious. Um, and so ideally, the final result would have been somewhere between um, the Parliament's position and the Council position, but actually it ended up much closer to the Council position. And this is what always tends to happen. The balance of power is much in the favour of the Council. So, uh, anyway, this was what happened, and we can talk about that more later if, if you're interested. Um, but anyway, just then a few reflections, um, which are not based on any um, sophisticated academic analysis, but some, some impressions that we had during the negotiations as to why it is that governments were anxious to weaken the directive so much. Um, I think the first thing is they just don't like targets, um, especially for something like energy efficiency where they're not even quite sure they'll be able to deliver them. It's being held accountable to something that they're not quite sure how to do. Um, and I think probably the only way to get them a bit more confident about it will be to demonstrate that it works and to start sharing the best examples from all around Europe of what has worked in certain countries and to hope that the energy efficiency directive, once it kicks in, will sort of become self-fulfilling. Um, we also had a problem with the energy efficiency directive in that there is a range across Europe of how much individual countries had already done on energy efficiency. And some countries like um, uh, some of the Scandinavian countries and Germany, for example, who'd actually done quite a lot already, certainly didn't want a new directive from Europe telling them how to do it better or what else to do. And the countries that hadn't done very much so far, which um, I mean, to generalise massively included quite a lot of the Eastern European countries, they had their reasons why they hadn't done very much on it so far. And of course, that included money and, and other things like that. And so therefore, they're, they're again still reluctant to, to take further action. So there was not even the people who are, you know, efficiency advocates really were, were keen on this directive. Um, then of course we had the fact that we're in an economic crisis and it was observed by many people that we talked to that actually um, even the renewable energy target and the greenhouse gas target would never have been agreed in the current economic situation. So it's a lot, it's unfortunate for energy efficiency really that discussions on this were happening at a time when no government wants to really pay any upfront costs, even if the energy efficiency measures would pay back in a few years, at the moment they're just thinking about now and next year. Um, also there is a big inbuilt, inbuilt fear, particularly in this economic climate, that limiting energy use limits your options for economic growth. Um, this I think is not a fair argument. Um, there is so much efficiency that can be done before you even touch economic growth, but um, and, and, and the, aim, the aim should be of course to decouple the, the, the growth from the energy use. Um, but it was something that was played on particularly by <coughs> energy intensive industries that sort of claimed in the same way they do in the context of the emissions trading system that if Europe's energy efficiency standards are too stringent then they'll just move outside of Europe and we won't have them anymore offering jobs. Um, and then, uh, then there's also the fact that energy efficiency is just generally seen by governments as quite peripheral. It's a kind of weird, niche, geeky, techie thing that is to do with light bulbs and stuff and it's not big and sexy and glamorous and part of the energy system. So it's not something that you've got governments or politicians particularly pinning their, um, their reputations on uh, or thinking that if they do a good job on an energy efficiency directive, they can cut a red ribbon in front of it and, and get a lot of kudos for it. So I think it suffers from that as well. Um, so anyway, nevertheless, we have got the directive. Um, and I think, oops, how do I go back? There we are. Um, I think it will bring some useful things. I think, um, obviously, it's got these targets, these 1.5, this 1.5 percent obligation that, um, that that countries will have to deliver each year. And I think many countries. 
many countries. <laughs> it's running out of time, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> that's good, I think I've got two slides left. Um, uh, energy companies, uh, m many countries do think that these energy company obligations are a good thing to do. And to the extent that that will help to open up a market for energy services, um, that will be a very good thing. Um, and I think, as we said before, there are a number of things in there that will stimulate um, efficiency improvements in certain sectors. So in these building roadmaps, even that rather lame uh, public buildings <laughs> obligation will increase the visibility of, of uh, buildings renovation. There is provisions on financing as well, so that will help to unlock financing. So I think there are a lot of things that it will help to improve compared to the status quo. And once it starts to really, you know, be, be de demonstrated how you do it and, and that it's a good thing, I think it will become a bit self-reinforcing. Um, so that's what we hope for. Um, and so just what else are we, those of us working on energy efficiency, what are we looking towards doing now? Well, one, of course, is making sure that this directive is well implemented um, and also that when it comes to be reviewed, um, that sufficient um, uh, additional measures are put in place if needed. Um, we also are thinking about how we can address that thing I just mentioned about how energy efficiency is seen as very peripheral to energy policy in general. Um, little cartoon here by the, uh, the guy who does the cartoons in Private Eye. I don't know if you know Private Eye. It's a satirical magazine in the UK. But um, anyway, the dream would be that at some point energy efficiency would really be seen as a valid energy source um, that was fit to compete with um, all the traditional things that you think of, like coal or nuclear or even renewables. Um, and in practice, uh, we'd actually really like it to be seen as the first energy source. As we've seen, it's the cheapest thing to do. It's the cheapest way to, uh, if you've got a gap between energy supply and energy demand, you can increase supply or you can bring down demand. And bringing down demand will always be cheaper. Um, but it also doesn't have any nasty emissions. It doesn't have any nasty waste. It doesn't um, require any unsightly infrastructure that's marching across the, the land. So it's, it's really a very good thing to do. And um, there's the concept of the trias energetica. I don't know if you've heard of that, which is a way of designing your energy system so that you should first reduce your demand as much as possible through efficiency measures. Then you fulfill as much of the remaining needs as you can with renewables. And then, if necessary, you look at other means like uh, fossil fuels, but using them as efficiently as possible. Um, that's the principle we'd like to instill into the energy system. And that means trying to talk in all of the debates that are going on in general energy policy discussions. So, for example, the EU's internal energy market, there's a lot of discussions going on about power market arrangements at the moment. Um, and we'd like to sort of first and foremost register the fact that the internal energy market should be the right size. You should first systematically do all of your energy efficiency and then you design the rules to work as effectively as you can. And one of the very systematic ways that you could do to try and look at doing energy efficiency before you do energy supply um, actually already exists in California. Um, they have this Environmental Quality Act uh, which says that you can't get planning permission for building a new power plant uh, unless you can demonstrate that it's not possible to meet the same need by the means of demand reduction. So that's a really very systematic way of doing it. So in practice what this means is I'm sitting in a lot of meetings at the moment with rather um, male, uh, scary, technical people that are talking about energy topics that I'm not used to talking about but trying to sort of just embed the idea of energy efficiency into their thinking but you know that's the way I think shift happens. So. Um, and then finally, the other big thing that's on the agenda at the moment is that actually, although 2020 is not yet upon us, um, discussions are really now starting up about 2030. Um, we, we all have this perspective out to 2050 of where we need to be in terms of our climate and energy uh, objectives. Of course, at some point you need to track that back to make it more, well, 2050 is a very long way off, but we need to know where we're headed in the medium term and the European Commission is already starting up discussions about what kind of climate and energy package it would like for 2030. And there are a lot of people who would like to just see an emissions target because they think that the carbon market will be enough to deliver um, all of the right solutions. And if that's nuclear and CCS, then so be it. Um, but uh, obviously the renewables industry very much wants a specific target for renewables like we have for 2020, and the energy efficiency community wants a target for energy efficiency. So what that's going on. Anyway, there we are. Thank you very much.
thank you very much, uh, Erika. So, um, we might um, press a bit drifting back also to the table, and we will open uh, the floor uh, for questions. Thanks, as I said, to uh, different takes on the same subject. You can see the influence of, or, or, and also the work of Professor Drifting in the IPCC uh, assessment report, where he's contributing to, and uh, likewise, and of course, the in view approach uh, more towards policies but uh, points of commonalities and some maybe not fully uh, aligned uh, 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 aspects as well we'll see we'll see what the audience will uh, bring up so i will next uh, would like to open the floor for questions that the audience might have can we introduce ourselves please? yes please uh, um, I mean, my name is Suna Schulberg. I'm a student at the Department of Geography at the University of Oxford in the UK. Um, and I have two, two different questions for both of you, so maybe I'll, I'll start with um, Professor Fabrini. Um I'm wondering about that chart you showed, so the original um, line, the extrapolation, and then later that, the extrapolation that you showed. And what I found interesting is, if I remember it correctly, you had the energy um, intensity at the bottom line, and then sort of the price per GDP um, on the, on the y-axis. And uh, so then you plot it, or this was an extrapolation from sort of, or regression from different countries that fall along that continuum. And I'm just wondering, so you take that line and then you tr extrapolate it um, from it. But I'm wondering, is that a realistic um, assumption? Does every country sort of move along the same, um, the same path? And, um, you know, is that also something that we want um, in terms of development of each country? I don't know how many developing countries you had on there because I'm also wondering about... I don't know, you take a country like the United States, where I think, you know, by I know, insulating buildings and so forth, you can reduce the en energy demand quite considerably. But take another country like Chile, heavily, heavily um, dependent on uh, natural resource ext extraction, I suppose, less energy use on a domestic level. So how, how would you factor that in? And the second question is, uh, is for you, um, different on, on policy um, fragmentation. So I'm wondering, so they're putting through this... Um, this uh, energy efficiency directive, but what about conflicts with other pieces of legislation, particularly in the member states? Is something you're considering? Short example: I've 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 um, worked with in the UK. Um, we we tried to um, come up with energy efficiency measures for an old building in Oxford, and, and as you might know, Oxford is full of wonderful and old buildings, and so all, most of these are are listed buildings in the UK, which means they're very stringent rules as to what you can do. Um, what we figured out is we couldn't put solar panels on the roof because that would look ugly. And uh, also we couldn't um, put in double glazing because um, that for some reason doesn't fit with whatever the UK government wants an old building to look like. So I'm wondering with that policy fragmentation, is there anything that, that you think about doing that, about that, and, and how could I go? Thank you. Thanks very much. Anybody else? Question from Claire, please, and then let's go first, Claire, and then let's go. Um, hi, I just have a, a very simple first question. Because we don't have um, a representative from the Danish Parliament, which is a pity, I'm just wondering if there was perhaps some Erica's um, experiences when the EED negotiations a real role played by Denmark as the presidency in the time of the negotiations. Um, because it's interesting that you mentioned that even the countries that ha are advanced in energy efficiency measures didn't seem to want to be ambitious on this piece of legislation. And Denmark is often considered the shining example in Europe of energy efficiency. So, yeah, I find that interesting to think about if I had a role to play. Paolo Dosaratti. Uh, question mainly for Professor Kroprogan. Um, we have um, insisted a lot on the um, need of, uh, uh, of uh, insisting on, on, on uh, energy taxation to increase uh, price to include externalities, but I found in the literature that this topic is very disputed. Uh, what would you think uh, about uh, um, policy options uh, that on the contrary would uh, uh, tax inefficiency, so not the energy cost but the, the, the energy inefficient use? 
Um, for example, uh, some uh, countries are beginning to, to, to put uh, uh, taxes on, on CO2 emissions of cars, um, kind of Peruvian taxes. Uh, what, do, what do you think, for example, of uh, uh, taxes on, on uh, inefficiency of buildings? We have uh, energy performance certificates that are becoming uh, compulsory now. Why not uh, having a synergy and, and using this kind of measurement uh, in order to, to, to create uh, uh, a mechanism that binds efficiency of the building to uh, property tax? This, uh, and, uh, this property yeah, the property tax uh, um, the company will be you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So maybe we start to answer? <laughs> yes, uh, uh, I would suggest that maybe we'll stop there. We have now uh, four or five questions uh, depending on the content. So uh, well, we have to stop the first one there and then take the second one. So I, I think the first question yeah, is supposed to The first question, uh, uh, it's an interesting, it's also an academic question, but a very right one. So on one point you are right that countries that are on a low intensity with a high price, of course uh, have less energy intensive activities. That means that the, let's say, the owner of an aluminum factory is choosing his siting in a country with a low price and therefore they have a high intensity. This is one of the, uh, we, we often say in economics, choosing by feet, eh? you walk where, where it's best. That's one. Now, this curve of extrapolation, uh, when you see such a curve of uh, orthogonal curve, it's uh, the price elasticity is minus one. Yes? And the price elasticity minus one means that the bills remain constant wherever you are on the curve. And this is so what a, a tendency attitude of many people regarding energy use. In a company, when do we become alert for energy issues? It's when the budget for energy that we had uh, targeted for the next year is, is, is doubled, for example. The, the expenses are double and then everyone has to move and do something about it. So therefore, there is a tendency to be on such a curve. Now, is it technically feasible to extrapolate? That's another question. I said that would be nice, but it's not necessary. Why it's not necessary? Except of extrapolating the curve, but that's actually not shown in this analysis here. You also have the possibility to shift the curves. And shifting the curves means innovation. But innovation is going on all the time in autonomous ways. And that what they also said, 1.5% uh, per year. But induced innovation needs pressure. And again, we see that really induced efficiency innovation needs pressure from prices and then you see the curves shift far more to the left and it becomes easier again to keep the bill under control because this is the purpose so you also uh, your question is, is, is a very interesting and thorough uh, to, to analyze but there are answers to this but it's a little bit conditional on the particular factors I tell you a small experience I had in my own life. I, I tried to, to build a passive house in the middle of the 90s. Yes? I saw in the literature, because I follow energy since long, I saw possibilities to find very efficient glazing. And there were printed leaflets of companies offering that glazing. So this was provided in my design. So uh, Then I was searching for that and I didn't find it. Finally, I contacted the company itself on the leaflet. I asked them, I want to buy those efficient uh, frames and glass. And they said, yes, we printed that forward in 1984, but we never made them because the prices went down. But this shows how important prices are 
also for making technology available. So I had to do with less efficient frames at that moment. Today, you are getting better. Or you have even efficient technologies that are left when the prices are low, are not developed, are not continuous. Mm. So it, it's important for us. Should I also know she also? Uh, would you like to comment on the first question as well? Or? Um, the second question. Second the and the third. Or same speaker? Well, I meant actually the first one, the first speaker, but uh, we can move to the second, the fragmentation one. Which yeah, is I don't think I have anything to add to okay. that. <laughs> so um, on, the, uh, on the conflicts, um, I think for the most part, every possible conflict, like the one that you mentioned, was used as a reason by member states to bring down the level of the requirements from the European Directive. So, for example, listed buildings are exempted even from this pathetic 3% renovation rate. Um, so, the member states were very attentive to that. Um, another thing they tried to do, actually, was to count actions that they've already done towards the new targets. So, they wanted to, I mean, I think Austria wanted to count stuff it had done as far back as 2000 towards this new target. And bearing in mind that even with current policies, we're due to miss the 2020 target, you know, it's not really helping a lot if you're counting stuff that's already in the part that's achieved. Um, so, the point with the directive really is just to hope that it helps to fill in some of the gaps and provide some sort of lubricating mechanisms, let's say, to um, fulfill measures that otherwise wouldn't take place. So for example, one of the other things it requires member states to do is to, I think the word is facilitate the establishment of financing facilities. Um, these would be um, sort of uh, setups which would pool different sources of public financing and use these to leverage private finance and then help to direct them towards projects. Because obviously one of the pro problems in getting projects to happen is just that money isn't available or even if it is available, um, it's not in the right form or the people don't know, the people who want to carry out a project don't know how they can access it, so it's a way to sort of try and fa fa facilitate all of that. Um, another conflict actually that, just on subject of conflicts, that did uh, get an awful lot of attention was the possible conflict uh, moving away from the sort of down on the ground example like you gave, but with the emissions trading system. Um, there was a lot of concern that um, by the people who really care about the functioning of the emissions trading system, that if um, the energy efficiency directive was too ambitious or too effective, then obviously it would succeed in bringing down emissions in those um, in those sectors which uh, are covered by the emissions trading system. But also, if you reduce energy uh, electricity use, then that's reducing the um, need for power, which would reduce the demand for allowances from the power sector, which would reduce the carbon price, which would reduce the effectiveness of the emissions trading system. And so uh, one of the other things that was written into the directive was that the impact of the efficiency directive on the emissions trading system would have to be monitored. Um, and this, in fact, has been a catalyst for um, new things that have happened. So actually a load of allowances are being delayed, their auctioning from is being delayed in the emissions trading system. I don't know how much into the details of the ETS you are. But anyway, that was, that was a big concern. And this was just an example of the policies not having been well thought through enough in the beginning. When they set the 2020 targets, if it had been anticipated that um, if we fulfilled the energy efficiency objective, obviously that would have an impact on the emissions trading sectors, um, then it could have been designed in a much more coherent way. And that's the kind of thing that we want to make sure happens for 2030. Um, yes, let's go on to the next question. Or maybe, can I just actually ask if you would like to comment on that? Because it re relates very much to the question of prices and the use of price mechanism. On the market, I mean, there are other macro level uh, instances, use of gas as a source of energy. I mean, how do you, do you have any comments on the same <laughs> fragmentation from, from an overall policy perspective, perhaps? Well, it, uh, partly it's fragmentation, but partly it's also uh, an enormous belief in emissions trading that uh, uh, when I was confronted first uh, in this, I immediately told this is a uh, uh, an instrument to to redistribute wealth, not to to fight climate change. So I was very critical for emissions trading mm -hmm. since 10, 15 years. But does it have to be a country? I mean, cannot they be combined? Uh, I, I don't think emissions trading is a real instrument for reducing.
carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. uh, and what, what you say for efficiency, I was thinking about the renewables directive and the renewables uh, support. They wanted to stop all renewable support for keeping emissions trading functioning. But why is emissions trading there for emissions trading? No, no I see hundreds of bureaucrats and bureaucrats working to keep the flagship floating. Yes? Mm -hmm. How effective it is, I doubt about this. It's, it's, no, it, 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 it's so difficult to steer this ship and now it's at eight or nine uh, uh, euro per ton. This is a price if you count this back to what you pay at the pump, but so little that it cannot have an effect. So to get a real effect, you must have much higher prices. Now, I think the belief in emissions trading is a belief coming from my colleague economist in that the, the world is flat and that you can cut emissions with one skip, one single instrument. Mm -hmm. the, the world is not flat, the world is very diverse. And if you have a skyline of New York, and you put one meter of, of curtain on it, this the price of emissions trading, the skyline remains uneven. And the belief of the economists is that by a uniform single price, current price, you would realize maximum efficiency all over the globe. But that assumes that you start from a flat condition. But conditions are not flat. Some people have instruments, everyone does something today. So what you really do is putting the same thickness on a very uneven scale and, and that is not becoming flat. I think that's so this is cool. but this is another lecture. <laughs> it's another lecture, <laughs> but it does lead to the next question, which is somewhat linked about the differences. I mean, that was pointed to the position of Denmark in this uh, overall yes. Uh, process. Yeah, sure. Um, well, actually, if I can just quickly comment sure. on that, that absolutely. I mean, I think. It's quite clear that with carbon prices at the level they're at at the moment, I think you're right, it's about eight euros a ton, it's having no effect at all. And I think there's even some of these sort of uh, very dry energy policy discussions I've been sitting in one today, actually, it was being discussed that actually if carbon prices carry on at this kind of level, then people will just be totally making the calculation that it's worth just building coal-fired power stations and paying, paying for the emissions and it's, it's really serving no purpose at all. But even if the price was quite a lot higher, I think it's very clear that we would still need um, dedicated policy frameworks to drive renewables and particularly energy efficiency as well, because of all of these other barriers that we spoke about, which have nothing to do with price really, it's to do with human behavior and habit and hassle and so on. And uh, I think um, therefore we need specific programs and policies to overcome these barriers and to get governments having sufficient uh, focus and priority on doing that, that's why I think we need specific targets also for energy efficiency because evidence shows that uh, it's only really when they've got this kind of compulsion that they actually start doing something about it. Mm -hmm. So just to, to then turn to the question about Denmark, um, yes, I mean as you mentioned, uh, Denmark was uh, the presidency during these negotiations and they are certainly the most energy efficient country in Europe and the most positive uh, about the power of energy efficiency policies. Um, and so in some ways it was actually quite, well, one could argue it was unfortunate that they were the presidency because they couldn't put their own voice forward so much. You know, they were in the chair, so they couldn't promote their positive um, view of, of energy efficiency policies as much as they would have done had they not been the chair. At the same time, presidencies do not have to be completely neutral. I mean, before that we saw that Poland w was the presidency for the very first part of the discussions, and they, to be honest, played quite a sneaky game where they, they kind of said for a long time, oh, we're just, we'll leave this mostly to the Danes who are coming after us, but we'll just, um, uh, we'll, we'll just sort of progress discussions and go through the directive line by line so that people are familiar with it by the time that we come to uh, the Danish presidency. And what they actually did was just before the end of their presidency, they had a council meeting where they, they actually pushed the process on much further than implied, and they put a lot of really quite damaging things into the, the text that they were discussing. 
So that meant the Danes inherited a terrible text that included all sorts of damaging things that were worse than the Commission proposal. So they started off at an even lower level than they would have they would have done anyway. So there are tactics that can be used by a presidency to further their cause. Unfortunately, Denmark, very energy efficient, also very diplomatic as a people and a country. I mean, I'm obviously generalising here and maybe I'd be slightly more moderated if they get to here. <laughs> but I mean, we had the impression that they were being perhaps excessively generous in letting small countries that were very resistant to energy efficiency speak up, just to be fair. Um, and it was almost as if their desire to be seen as fair and um, balanced and, and neutral and so on actually by far and away overrode their, their desire to, to push towards a, a good outcome. On the other hand, the negotiations were extremely difficult and it's not like they had an easy, easy job on their hands with all of these very negative countries in the room. And I think they are to be congratulated probably for steering the things toward to, towards a, an agreement which at the end of the day is definitely in progress on what we had before. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a tricky one being a presidency and one thing that they said to us actually was, and a lot of countries say this, because it's a, that's one of the problems of the six months rotating presidency, especially now with 27 member states, you know, you don't get to do it very often. And so when you're the presidency, maybe about four months in, you know what you're doing with it and you know, you know how to effectively chair all of these meetings and so on. But actually you're sort of learning by doing and you've almost, you know, you've had your, um, your sort of trial period at the, almost at the point when you've got to, got to finish it. And I think, um, I'm not quite sure what solution can be found to that, but I think uh, Denmark admitted that they, they, they possibly would have done things slightly differently had they had their time over again. But. Just add on that, as I mentioned to you, it's a pity uh, she was not here, because I, I think looking at it and hearing it from another Scandinavian country's perspective, I think one of the criticisms, despite, or maybe, uh, I mean, what you said was exactly that they actually were very good in showing us if it was neutral, but I need that the standards that were behind uh, all these uh, uh, that were established were actually their own standards, and there was little, let's say, tolerance for doing things in different ways, and which, if you link this uh, debate to the overall competitiveness pricing, that type of you know aspects of it seems a bit negative, but you would. Your, your perspective seems to be positive, more positive about that. You felt that they were not really able to push their agenda to the full, which has been a little bit what I heard, that they actually were able to do it with the standards okay. that were set up. Um, that was not the impression that we okay. had from our It's interesting. I said it's a bit issue. It's not there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's very good. But let's move to the, uh, to the next uh, question, uh, which was about the, uh, about the taxis and uh, the idea of taxing the inefficiencies in the society. Uh, also connecting a little bit back to the ETS, I would like to remind <laughs> one of the slides I've shown, how do you decompose emissions per person? You remember there were three factors at the right side, this was uh, wealth per person, energy intensity and renewable energy. So we have instruments for renewable energy, we have instruments for efficiency, or we should have, and then we need an instrument to moving a little bit the composition of the GDP towards a low energy or low carbon GDP. Yes? And what do you best invent for this? Uh, not a uniform instrument, I believe, because the world is so diverse. It's so, so, so composed of different tastes, different people, different realities at the moment, that one of the indicators you could apply there is that what is the share of a country in realizing its public budget, and what share is there in what we call today environmental taxes. And this is published by Eurostat year after year for all the countries of Europe, for example. And then you see that Denmark has their 12.5% about, and Belgium has 2.5%. That makes the difference in energy efficiency into these countries. This is a yardstick, it's quite easy to measure. You have it year after year if you want. And the proposal that we made in one of the articles we read is every country should make progress on that indicator year after year. 
So how are they going to realize this by inventing creative taxes adapted to the country like the Danish did and other countries did to raise the share of public money coming from environmental taxes? That means energy tax, CO2 taxes, taxes on inefficient buildings and so on. I don't know what creativity you can have to name something and to, to find some adapted environmental tax. But I, I'm really scared of thinking that by a uniform instrument you can solve anything. If you put a price in Europe, a tax, a carbon tax, like France once was discussing and proposing for Europe, what does it mean 10 euro per ton for Bulgaria or 10 euro per ton for Germany? That's a huge difference. So what's uniform? So it's not 10 euro per ton for the two countries. But how much is it for Bulgaria? How much? So you have then a price by country. But the price by country, and you have the region in the country. And Belgium, is Flanders and Wallonia the same price? Or should we have 12 for Flanders and 8 for Wallonia? Mm. For various reasons. And there we go. So uniformity is a false solution because the reality is enormously diverse and that that's a, a message I really want to 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 announce and the ETS on this point turns has no place in the three factors you see you have the three factors there but where is the ETS well, what's the ETS really doing hmm. uh, yeah, but that's another discussion <laughs> <laughs> We seem to be coming to the other discussion. <laughs> <laughs> but that's stay to efficiency. But 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 in, on the very point of inefficiencies, I mean, you said no, not not the same uh, tax, but I mean, does it does it also apply that for achieving the inefficiencies? Yeah, for, it, it well, doesn't make a difference. Uh, but what is? How do you measure efficiency of a house? I think you only measure it by fuel consumption. And if you tax the fuel used in the house, then you and you tax inefficiency of the time. Mm, sure. But I mean, yeah, you could relativize that perhaps the country is still low. Well, or, or you can you can have a policy in a country that you say, well, there's poor people who cannot afford high bills for, for heating. Mm -hmm. Then you have to, to not put a uniform price on the wealthy and the middle class and the mm -hmm. poor, but maybe find ways that the poor have to pay less taxes mm -hmm. or are helped. To, to obtain a very efficient dwelling. Not, for example, Brussels, this city now is really doing actively. Mm -hmm. They want uh, passive social housing. That's the standard now. Mm -hmm. now this is the real solution. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this is helping them. But when the money of paying those passive houses must come from somewhere, it should not come for taxing them that poor people are on, on buying their food. Mm -hmm. It should come from taxing inefficient energy used by the wealthy mm -hmm. or by the big cars or, or whatever. So this is, uh, and this you can measure by the statistic that we have in Europe. All right. Good. I think we have just a little bit of time. Let's take one question. Can I use the, uh, uh, the monopoly of the chair? I'll just post one question as well. Go ahead. Yeah. Kevin Layton, uh, and former uh, energy advisor in the Commission. Um, I think we must be more rigorous, particularly in an academic setting, about definitions. Energy efficiency is not the same as energy consumption. It's not the same as energy demand management. They're different dimensions. Uh, energy is a factor of production. And if we see it as a factor of production, then I'm a bit more optimistic that innovation is coming because not that we're searching for energy efficiency in itself, but we're searching for better ways of doing other things and energy comes into that. So if we see the development of the car, the engine in the car, that has been designed over 20, 30 years and it's getting more efficient. Now, for that reason, I would look and say, you're right, energy efficiency is expensive because we're looking for additional increments of it. My own calculations, that they're, they're pretty old now, is that Productivity, there's a secular trend in productivity of about 1% per annum if you take a 50-year cycle over that. And energy is embedded in that. So 
gradually there is improvements in energy efficiency. We're adding to that by better consumption methods, by better demand side methods. But when I come back, I think the wrong message has been sent out that energy efficiency is cheap and is low-hanging fruit. It's not. It's, we haven't been leaving that low-hanging fruit for 50 years, and certainly not since 1973. Energy, we're getting some of it in, 1% per annum. When we ask for 1.5%, that's an incremental on 1%, and therefore goes into your cost curves from a different direction. You're not looking for the basic, the base load energy efficiency. You're looking for an increment of one and a half percent. And one way or the other, that is much more expensive. Now, it seems if we can get the horse and cart going, then we can come back and see how we can build on the wreckage of that last energy efficiency. Because what really worries me is that that has kicked energy efficiency off the political agenda for a number of years. And the, 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 the directive we've got now. And we know the weakness in that. And it's much more weak than than I think we would like to say publicly. I'm worried that we can't get energy efficiency back into the discussion much quicker. So I think we have to put our thinking caps on and see how we can come back in and attract a wider coalition of people interested. And to my mind, it is looking at the innovation agenda and to see can we argue through coming at the innovation agenda a much more exciting role for energy in general innovation policy. Very good. Uh, comments slash question. My question is a short one. Uh, the GDP was mentioned a lot. In, uh, in short, is it possible to uh, do this without actually, or with constantly increasing GDP? Should we look beyond that? Or is it so optimistic that we don't have to really <coughs> sacrifice our GDP at all to actually get to the kind of levels that we're talking about? Uh, that my point is a little bit. In the past, I also was around quite critical for the GDP as an indicator, mm -hmm. and I said we need a new indicator to, to measure the good things and right. But no, I, I, I think the solution is to make the GDP right. Mm -hmm. and the GDP right means that the externalities, the bad things, should cost very much. So we have a large GDP then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but people will shift them from the bad things to the good things. And okay. maybe the volume of the GDP in, in dollar terms will come down, although mm -hmm. inflation will come down. But, but it will be another GDP. It, it will be, mm -hmm. and, and that's what everyone who is thinking over 40 years sees as a necessity. We will have other cities. We will buy, we will walk, we, we will live differently and spend less resources. So something will completely changed in the GDP, but it's still a, a measure of activities, activities mm -hmm. and prices. This is the GDP. Right. And I don't know if it will be higher or lower, and that's not so important. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's included. What about the innovation uh, well, comment, uh, remark? Uh, do you agree well, with that? I, I agree with all points. So first, it's so that people now is rational and have the rational efficiency that they want. Mm -hmm. I, I've studied barriers for IPCC for 10, 15 years, and the more I think about barriers, the less I see them. That's the problem. Yes, the less I see them. Because people is quite rational in using energy. No one likes gas, and you said it yourself. We no? you, you like services. No kilowatt hour, no gas, no coal, no coal. So for this impeccable product, we are quite rational already today. A and when we have to improve, we, we need innovation, and innovation is not free, so you have to pay for this. I'm not quite agreeing on one point that it, it's, it's only general innovation. Within innovation, you have various houses, and energy in innovation is still a separate house. And we have seen this, the push for renewables, for example, at the given moment. Of course, renewables have served on all the other innovations, new materials, uh, and so on. But still you had wind innovation, and you had uh, photovoltaics innovation, and so on. Even surfing on there. So this is a little bit different on this. But it comes not uh, free, but when the public money is coming from the levies on that energy, then you have the money to invest and support that innovation. 
then you can pay mm -hmm. for this. And it's such a curve, like the one there, if you want to go to the left, you have to pay your cost, but you normally can pay perfectly with the levies of your income. Mm -hmm. This is the this is rule. Yeah, okay. Erika, last comment? Uh, I mean, any, any comments on the two last questions? Yeah, just uh, briefly, I mean, on, on the point about GDP, this this 20% potential that we're talking about of uh, that the EU could achieve is supposed to be, well, according to the Commission's calculations, supposed to be cost-effective. So it will cost less than, it, it will save more money than it costed to install. Um, and the problem, I think, uh, really is just a question of mobilising the money to pay for it, um, whether it comes from public budgets uh, in, in the form of taxes or use in this or whether it's just individual householders or, or consumers or whatever who decide to invest in, uh, in efficiency measures. Um, it's just a question of getting the financial flows going, I think. Um, but the other thing I would say, about, I mean, I, I, I think those are very interesting points that you made. On the innovation policy, the only thing I'd say there is that I think quite a lot of the things that could be done, it's not specifically about new technologies that there, I mean, you probably know much more about this than me, but there are a lot of the technologies to deliver these efficiency potentials do already exist. And the question is just how to get them into place. Um, and so it's really things where it's almost like cost isn't necessarily the only barrier. It's all about, it's more policy innovation that you need to how to, how to get the delivery mechanisms um, matching up the, the service offerers with the, with the people who are interested in using them and actually creating that interest, creating that demand. Um, and so it's about sort of clever policy design, I think, at least as much as new technologies. So politically, they are hanging lower than technically, I guess. Yeah, I suppose so. All right. Well, let us not hang our heads low anyway. Uh, we can actually keep them high up. And looking forward to the next session, which exceptionally will be on Thursday. Uh, so uh, I will be uh, glad to invite you to the next, uh, indeed, next uh, uh, lecture in the series, which will be on new gas pipelines and electricity grids in 2050. And that's going to be held on the 22nd of uh, November. I said that's a Thursday. And also not here, but exceptionally on the other side of the street at the VUV campus. Uh, there, uh, the kind of the insides of the campus, uh, close to the Opinion Cafeteria, there's the main entrance. Glass cube, surely very well insulated. Uh, with your, not you with your glass, but with some other glass. Then. Um, and you enter that, and there it's the lecture room D002, which is uh, down the stairs. So I invite um, you all. It's a D005. Oh, D005. Yeah, okay. It's a D004. Okay, sorry, old program. So D005 then. Anyway, same door uh, and, and uh, other different room. So I welcome you there. Thanks very much for very good questions. And a big uh, round of applause, I think, to our uh, speakers.